Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Especially this week, I want to welcome you to the launch of the SP2 speaker series, Confronting Racial Injustice and the Inequities of the Pandemic. My name is Sally Bachman. I'm the Dean of the School of Social Policy and Practice here at Penn, also known as SP2. Today's program, Race, AI, and the New Frontier for Civil Rights will be hosted by our colleague, Ben Jealous. Mr. Jealous is a visiting scholar at the Annenberg School of Communication, the Cary Law School, and luckily for us, also at SP2. He also serves as president of People for the American Way. I'm proud to say that Ben's connection to SP2 traces back to his 104 year old grandmother, who I've been fortunate enough to communicate with, who is a graduate of the school. Ben's commitment and his grandmother's to social change and racial, racial justice is a perfect alignment with SP2's mission and our time. During these challenging times, conversations like the one we'll have today play an important role in addressing the complex social problems that SP2 is committed to addressing through education, research, and civic engagement. And now it is my deep honor to introduce you to Mr. Ben Jealous. Thank you, Ben. Take it away. Thank you, Sally. It's great to be here. And uh... I spoke to my grandma last night and she's, she's very excited that I'm doing this. As you know, um, her pen blanket hangs over her chair in her, in her apartment at her retirement home. Um, I'm pleased to be part of this new series and today's program, which directly connects to my work at the Nexus, social change, media and technology. Bringing together race and technology, this session will focus on how technology and digital platforms shape race and impact communities of color, the role of social policy in all of this, and the opportunities to construct constructive e interventions. If you have questions during the event, please use the Q&A tab to submit them. We will get to as many as we can later in the program. To help set the stage for how these topics resonate with me and my work to connect tech and civic engagement. So I'll ask you for a second to think about what was going on last week in Georgia. In Georgia, we at People4, uh, about five organizers, volunteers who sent 1.5 million texts focused on uh, every black voter who didn't vote in 2016 or 2018. 90% of the texts were opened and about 10% of the folks asked for help. Having grown up as an organizer since the age of 14, having organized with Stacey Abrams since we were college kids when we were 20, we couldn't do then what we can do now. When you add tech to human, all of a sudden you can have a much bigger impact, an impact for good, an impact for bad. Oftentimes the impact reflects the technologist, the person designing the technology, using the technology. And we'll get into those impacts, good and bad today. Uh, really want to encourage everybody here to be dreaming, you know, not just fearing uh, what other evil, you know, James Bond characters might be doing with technology, but also dreaming about the ways in which you can use technology to, mag to magnify your good in the world. And now it's my distinct honor to introduce today's speakers. We have Professor Dixon Roman. He's an assistant pr prof here at SP2. He is the director of the Master of Science and Social Policy Program and chair of data, data analytics, stuttering today, data, Analytics for Social Policy Certificate Program. We're also joined by Mutale Nkande, who is CEO of the nonprofit comms firm AI for the People. She holds fellowships at Stanford and Notre Dame and is an affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University. Professor Dixon Roman, Let's start with you. Please introduce us to your work and lay the theoretical base for how you view the intersection of race, 
and technology. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. And um, before I start, let me go ahead and do a share screen real quick because I want to share an image for us all to take a look at. And I think it will be better to look at than my own uh, uh, face here. So of course, I'm having issues finding it right now. Oh, here we go. Uh, okay, here we go. All right, are you all able to um, see this image? All right, I'm gonna leave it in this regular screen. I'm. You can ignore the other sort of slides on the side there. Um, um, but uh, okay. So yeah, again, thank you, Ben, for the gracious introduction and for hosting this important speaker series for SP2. Um, are you all still seeing the image? Just want to be sure. Okay, all right. Um, I also want to extend my appreciation to the Dean and uh, Kristen for organizing, um, uh, Kristen Deerpour, I should say, for, uh, for organizing this important uh, speaker series and also for uh, Mutale and, and Conde for joining us in this conversation today. Uh, the work that she and her organization are doing is so profoundly relevant for SP2 and more broadly, U.S. democracy and the future of racial justice. So um, thank you, Mitali, and I'm looking forward to this conversation with you today. Um, today, I'd like to briefly discuss a few points related to racializing forces, affect, post-truth political discourse, and AI. Let me begin by sharing these two images um, of 2016 Facebook ads from the Russian Internet Research Agency. These Facebook ads are hallmark examples of post-truth political discourse. As Luciana Parisi, cultural theorist, argues, post-truth political discourse might be characterized by a play on affective predispositions and bodily responses of all beliefs that reappear as new. This process is particular to our condition of computational culture, through which we might understand post-truth as the indeterminacies of an affective haunting of past presenting and present futurity, that is to say, the ways in which the past are literally saturating and, and, and we might even say infiltrating the present and likewise futurity receding into the present. This history of the present creates the conditions for what cultural theorist Brian Masumi has called onto power, which is an affective politics that is based on an operative logic of preemption. Onto power is, of, is a power of emergence and of becoming sovereign. Under this operative logic, one is incited, and I'm emphasizing incited, think of the links here, to preemptive, preemptively act on an unknown unknown and constructed threat before it acts on oneself. What is more striking about the Facebook examples I'm sharing here are the ways in which in fact is not unrelated to the insurrection of January 6th, um, and is that they each play on an, on an ontogeny, on a becoming that has been sociopolitically constituted, reenacting not just any kind of affective predisposition, but a racializing affect, one that I would characterize as a racializing affect, one that is just felt literally emergent in the body in and of itself that is part of a formation of a subject that is it's lodged in colonialism as a recursion of the legacy of white nationalism, slavery, dispossession, and the reiterative actions against violent forces of racism and sexism. This is particularly important as technologies have long been centrally configured in racial capitalism, a political symbolic and political economic project that necessitates the extraction and appropriation of racially subjugated bodies for the interests of capital accumulation. As Wendy Chung cogently art articulates, the first iteration of technologies were enslaved Africans, at, at least I should say under the project of, uh, of the global project of, cap of, of racial capitalism. During industrialism, the enslaved body shifted to machine production and eventually the sentient technologies of com computation and AI. As Denise Ferreira da Silva argues, the logics of raciality went from a logic of enslavement to a logic of obliteration, as the former enslaved bodies needed to be subjugated to maintain the orders of whiteness and white supremacy in the new political economic order of post-Civil War. 
What's most relevant here is how that logical raciality and the conceptualization of the human that it rests on was part of the presuppositions in the developments of science, technology, and governance from the post-enlightenment to today. Let me provide an example. It is now well documented, including in federal filings such as the Mueller report, that the Russian Internet Research Agency used social media in order to try to influence the 2016 U.S. presidential elections. And we also know the 2020 presidential elections as well. It is clear from these ads, as well as from the Mueller report, that the Russian Internet Research Agency was engaging in a post-truth political discourse that was playing on the indeterminacies of already existing political beliefs. These were not necessarily conscious political beliefs. In fact, while Facebook ads necessitate the symbolic, they also may still register autonomic or visceral bodily reactions that are non-conscious. The political beliefs of these ads, I argue, were of the changing same recursion of colonialist reason and the bodily reactions based on the activation of the fleshy racialized body. This agenda of the behavioral shaping and programming of the human is not new to Russia, and in fact was one of the US constructed narratives of the Russians during the Cold War. As part of the US propaganda during the Cold War, the Russian military and even public were often depicted as human automatons in media and popular culture. This narrative depiction was playing on ideas of the brainwashing of the human via classical condition, conditioning, and as such, constitutions of the human automaton. Of course, ideas of human brainwashing and programming were counter to the ideals of Western freedom based on individual agency and choice. Thus, the communist public of Russia was believed to, to, uh, to lack uh, to have lacked freedom and was nothing more than human automatons to the communist regime or communist um, system. Ironically, while these were, were narrative constructions of the, Russia, of the Russians during the Cold War, we have found in recent times that such ideas may, may not be too far off from what really is. The, uh, the Russian Internet Research Agency use of Facebook ads is based on ideas from behavioral psychology, human programming, and the human automaton. The Russian government adopted bots and trolls as key mediums for propaganda early on. And as a former KGB lieutenant uh, colonel, uh, Putin knew firsthand the influential power of the media. Thus these efforts of using social media ad algorithms uh, to try to shape human behavior is not new and is situated in a longer history of state control and manipulation. Here we focus specifically on the techno social systems of the Facebook ad um, API. Although we are not able to gain direct access to the proprietary ad algorithm of the Facebook ad API, it is possible to back your way into understanding what the algorithm is doing, or that is to say what the logic of the algorithm is via a series of experiments. In a study conducted by Ali and colleagues, they learned that while advertisers can specify the parameters of the target populations they would, they would like to reach, Facebook ads algorithm employs an automated optimization procedure that deploys the ad already beyond what was initiated. In other words, Facebook is running automatic text and image classification on ads in order to calculate a predicted relevance score to users. This alters who sees this ad before it is even interacted with by users on Facebook. In addition, this study found that the amount of money invested in the Facebook ads, the content of the ads, the user interactions with the ad, i.e. generated ad clicks, each shaped who became digitally interpolated by the ad, who became selected for the ad. In fact, in a, body, in a bodybuilding ad the study created, they found the ad was delivered to over 75% men on average, while a cosmetics ad they created was delivered to over 90% women on average. Although we may not know the specific algorithms of the Facebook ad API, we do have a good sense of its performative force and its logic. Both the Russian Internet Research Agency and Cambridge Analytica used the Facebook ad API to deliver propaganda on known politically divisive content. They especially deployed, deployed content that was shaped by an assumption of racial hierarchies and subjugation, likely enacting non-conscious and even visceral racially, racialized bodily responses of its viewers. What's most important is that it was, it was through the interactions of the visceral racialized bodily responses that the ads 
um, that likely became recursive forces for the algorithm to, to not just deploy ads of racializing affects, but for that racializing feedback to become part of the logic, the very logic of the algorithm in and of itself. That is to say, as one is interacting with, it, it's producing more data for that ad algorithm to actually be um, recursively feed and fold right back into its logic. It is in and through the recursion of such racializing forces that the algorithm becomes an heir to the logics of raciality producing sociopolitically shaped predictions, if it wasn't already. It is these algorithmic affects that would have sent these ads to homogenous clusters of the population. It is also algorithmic affects that preemptively enact political behavior such as Russian internet research agency fabricated protests as well as voter turnout for Donald Trump and voter suppression for Hillary Clinton. There's more that actually could be said now as, um, as a result of the materiality of January 6th insurrection. The modulating acts of algorithmic governance are not only ca capacitating, they're also debilitating. Debilitating in the sense of constraining political behavior. The racializing forces of Russian internet research agencies ads produced a biopolitics of algorithmic capacitation and debilitation, one that compromised any notion of democracy via the logics of racial hierarchies and manufactured threats, anxieties, and desires. As Gabriel, as Gabriel Garcia Marquez stated, quote, give me a prejudice and I will move the world. That's precisely what the Russian Internet Research Agency did via the Facebook ad API, working with others such as Donald Trump and his administration um, and many others, um, they affectively moved the United States. I'm gonna end off on just a couple of sort of what's needed sort of comments, or at least profferings, if you will. Um, one, without a question, I think there's need for legislation to, to demarcate the ethical and legal boundaries and consequences of digital acts of misinformation. And in fact, I'm gonna give a head, to, head nod to my colleague, Matale, who I know is doing exceptional work on this in this area. Two, Without a question, K through 12 education needs to needs um, to help better shape a public that is able to, to be discerning of digital content. And that's based on an anti-racist education fundamentally. Three, the design and deployment of algorithms that work the logic of disinformation against itself. Well, so let me put this another way. If we know and understand the logic, if we have any sense of the logic of, of the algorithms of disinformation, then we could also actually develop algorithms that are working against it, working against their very logics. Um, and in fact, um, and use that as a way of identifying those very um, forms of dis disinformation. I'm going to include deep fake in this as well. Finally, related to the latter, working the affective forces of the preemptive culture of algorithms, we need to move toward the aims of, a, of an anti-colonial fugitive, uh, anti-colonial system and, and the enabling of fugitivity and abolition in and through algorithmic cultures that are working against techno-capitalist systems of, of expropriation, um, appropriation, uh, extraction, uh, and, and such. So I, I'm going to stop there and, and looking forward to hearing from Mutali. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dixon Roman. And uh, I just want to apologize to Mutali because she has to follow a professor who managed to connect Gabriela Garcia Marquez, the KGB, and the civil rights agenda. So with that high bar, you're up next, Mutali. Um, and that's all I have to say. No. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you for this kind invitation. And uh, Pro Professor Dixon Roman, uh, I think you've laid a really good uh, grounding to how we actionalize that. So for, for those that don't know, my name is Mitali Nkande. I lead an organization called AI for the People. And for anybody that loves reggae, they'll, they'll know that it's not just a riff on we the people, but an old, old reggae song that my parents danced to way before I was born. And the call back to the crowd is, and the people. So it starts with no, 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 no. And then the rest of it goes to the people. And the people that I'm speaking about are the people that will never interact with the Ivy League, the people that will never know um, or care about um, long, long terms and, and new theories, but the people who, despite that, are 
extremely intimately um, implicated in the use of these AI systems. So uh, Professor, Professor Dixon Roman spoke very intimately um, in, in terms of social media, and that's actually an expertise I hold also. But in order to let you know what we do, I think it, it would be better if I think about how we think about AI agnostically. So AI systems being at their very base, computer software, um, computer software devices that take on higher cognitive functions. So in computer vision and facial recognition, we are simulating sight. When we, I don't say this because I'm a privacy expert and do not want Siri or her friends telling the FBI what I'm doing. But for those of you that don't mind, you might ask Siri to uh, play you a song or to order you something offline, and all of that information is being catalogued. And there are third, there are third, uh, third party vendors who can then buy that information to make racialized technological capitalism more efficient. Right. So one of the gaps that we identified, I'm a journalist by training. I became a technologist when uh, Twitter took my job and a senator from Illinois uh, called Barack Obama was running for president and literally looked around the room and said, who could use Twitter? Of course I couldn't. I was like me, sir. I worked at the BBC in these fancy places and I can and I didn't know how to use it, but I did work out how to use it in 2008. But the reason that we existed is that we saw this communication gap, which is why I'm so um, excited, Ben, that you're at Annenberg as well as the poly I feel like we we probably have very similar interests. And what I saw as the communication gap was there had to be a place for the people that I sat with in church, the people, even though they're being gentrified, that the that, that guard the corner of my block needed to understand that as they went through public life, these technologies that are taking on these higher cognitive functions aren't just looking at them, but are looking at them with the desire to surveil. When they go on social media, and um, I sit on the TikTok content advisory board, part of that role is that I'm looking at black kids dance all day, but also part of that role is me being an advocate within that room to say that these black dancing bodies cannot be sold for advertisers in the way that their ancestors were sold onto plantations to create create that generation of value, right? So looking for equity in the in politics, uh, we didn't think that we would get into politics, but when we, uh, through my policy work, had started to realize what dis and misinformation didn't just mean in the context of an election, but what it meant in context of healthcare and healthcare delivery. And we started to see um, the lie that Black people could not get COVID. And, um, my i'm an i'm an immigrant to this country but my sister and i both emigrated here and she was a professor at upenn medical school um feel sorry for her you all i mean i guess we're we're just ivy league junkies i don't know what it is but i knew through my sister that black people could in fact get infected but the delivery system by which this information was given was on social media so we created a firm that would use film television hip-hop and journalism to communicate these things out so in the last um, election cycle we had a partnership with the hip-hop um, political education summit and we spent a lot of time on panels telling black audiences much uh, in universities and other spaces that when they were sharing clicking on content they were engaging and what we called a counter civic dis misinformation right not disinformation but misinformation miseducation and then going back to these ideas of the miseducation of the the negro and that particular that particular experiment was uh, based in Philly. I can talk about it either. Y'all um, y'all did the damn thing. We beat disinformation, D different Zoom. We also um, were looking really through policy, again, at the surveillance state and ideas of who is racist, who's dangerous and how they're dangerous, becoming embedded into systems. And I'm actually writing a book. My my agent is going to be like, really? You're really writing, Matali? You're back to writing? But I am writing a book, it will be finished, called um, Automated Anti-Blackness. And the 
the central canon of that book is we don't even need white supremacists to be personalized anymore. We can encode those logics into technology and then project them into the future. And at base, the work that we do with AI through the people, through video production and other, other ways of using media is really resist, really in the same tradition of all freedom fighters across the, the Black diaspora create, a, create our alternative communication systems and say, no, there are Black people in the future and those Black people will be free. And uh, it was our great pleasure, even in this election cycle, I haven't known uh, Stacey Abrams for nearly 30 years, but really working with Insane Foot and some of the organizers in the New Georgia Project, as we looked at the increased support that Black men were giving uh, Trump, and then we looked at the exit polls, it was a six point lead, to try and figure out not just race and technology, but what happens when those logics intersect with misogyny and with other forces in a moment of uh, deep economic anxiety. Um, and so we are very excited. Uh, we're in talks with some funders around now about new markets that we that we found through micro influences and others, and hoping that we can create new economies of knowing not necessarily using the platforms that we have, because I think that we can radically reimagine these platforms, but in that interim step, as we think about rebuilding after COVID, what role does an engaged Black social citizenry play in bringing us back to our core values of peace, love, justice uh, for all? And after January 6th, that's, that's a question that is even more urgent in my mind. Thank you, thank you. And I, you know, I know that there are white supremacists out there who have a vision for the world without black people, where there's just technology that perform the functions that they assign to black people. I've never heard a black activist with a vision of the world where we don't have white supremacists, we just have like automated white supremacists and we just assign certain functions to them. So that's, that just kind of blew my mind. Um, <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, uh, I'm excited to get into this conversation and really excited about the implications of it. You know, there is a, a part of what um, inspired me to come to the school and to teach is a graduation ceremony that both me and Professor uh, Dixon Roman were at where we first met, where it was clear that every doctoral student from SP2 walking across the stage, like ah, three quarters of them um, had a doctoral dissertation that had real implications for tech or that tech had real implications for how to solve that problem. So I'm really excited that we're starting these, these conversations. And let's, let's get into the conversation. Uh, for Mutale, what inspired you to create AI for the people? Like what was that moment, that kind of light bulb moment? So much of the work that I do, I, I am considered, from a funding perspective, I'm considered a public interest technologist. So I'm a refugee of uh, Google and of uh, like the children's coding movement, but only black children. We were going to teach white children to lead while black children could have these, you know, futuristic blue collar coding jobs. Um, and when I got into fellowships, that's how I have so many affiliations. And on these fellowships, I would often be sitting with white colleagues doing important work that didn't have a racial lens. And they would be doing talks and getting PhDs and uh, becoming global experts. And I would be on a fellowship applying for another fellowship. And I wrote, um, the Ford Foundation had asked me to reflect on one of my experiences and I described it as a two-tier two um, employment system in which black brilliance were the gig workers and we were either we were saving the world while applying for our next gig while our white counterparts were holding the world in place using the same tools and um i you know clearly disgruntled about this i went to a photocopier at one of these institutions and they had their budget on the photocopier and they were spending more on snacks than my stipend. And so, and, and this is at a time that I was introducing a federal legislation on AI to the US House of Representatives. And so 
I was like, word, well, we can all apply for a grant now. And um, the MacArthur Foundation, Eric Sears, uh, who I shout out everywhere, had invited me to a, a funder retreat. And at that funder retreat, I was like, look, you guys are publishing so much on Uber and I'm in the Uber of technology. And he, uh, he said, and I think you are too. And he gave me a really, really small grant to see whether uh, black folks would be interested in this. If we created something, could we get ordinary black people to respond? And the, the answer was yes, we could. And we could, we could create uh, jobs. And this is prior to, to COVID. And so AI for the people was really born out of this imaginary for a new economy that placed uh, technology within racial justice work and organizing, and also at the same time, developed new modes of communication that would require new theoretical imaginaries, but also require the idea that anti-Black racism was shape-shifting again, and we were gonna catch it. Thank you, thank you. And for there's so much there, and we're like on a tight timeline. So I'm like uh, shifting to the next question. So, to Professor Dixon Roman, uh, can you provide a breakdown of techno capitalism? How it how has it accelerated in the midst of the pandemic? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief so we can really you know continue to have a meaty conversation here. Um, and um, so, I mean, uh, capitalism. I will say is always um, fundamentally necessitated technologies in its various forms um, for extraction, um, purposes of expropriation, appropriation, and fundamentally toward capital accumulation, uh, interest of capital accumulation. Um, so technology has always been part of capitalism. Um, the very notion of technical capitalism is a system of human and technological relations that provides the modes, means, and relations of production of racial capitalism. Acceleration, I think, um, especially uh, of technology and the interest of capital development has been in the making for, in fact, I would say decades. I mean, some might say going even further back than this, but I, I think one, one critical juncture where we can point to, or at least some have pointed to, has been the mid 70s, around 76, 77, um, where there's been, where there were multiple forces that were at play. One, we see income, wealth and wealth inequality uh, the, uh, uh, begin to increase and take off around there, in, at least in the United States. Um, but we also see globalization taking major material footing around that point and the advancement of information and communication technologies at that point. Um, and so uh, if there's a, any particular point in which one might point to, this is one, at least one of probably many that one can point to where we begin to see the acceleration of technological development in the interest of capital. Um, and and in fact, what I, would, what I would say is that the pandemic has merely accelerated this beyond the control of governance and governmentality. Um, the ethical, all of the ethical concerns of literally last year, like yesteryear, if you will, that, that were floating around in, in, in Congress, floating around in various um, sectors of, of think tanks and such, um, I mean, I think the think tanks are still there, but uh, whether whether these are conversations on among and within Congress is a whole nother story because they're boggled down by the need to be responsive to the pandemic. They need to be responsive to um, a completely politically divided um, country and insurrections and uh, uh, unarmed police um, violence and such. So, I mean, anti-black violence one can go on here, right? And so, as a result. Um, this, this has resulted in a kind of a sidestepping, a forgetting of the interest of using digital, uh, toward the interest of using digital technology to meet the necessity of physical distancing under COVID-19. Um, and so uh, the consequence of, of this is, is not just the forgetting of those ethical questions, but also what is going to be the likely, we're already seeing it, sectors of the economy that are going to be lost, that are going to be obliterated products, literally forms of products that are going to become obsolete. The textbook that we once have known, we are going to see less of, and, and we know this without a question. Um, if it even survives this pandemic, is, 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 it will be, will be um, a, a, a feat on its own. Sectors of the labor force that will be lost as a, as a result, and new forms of inequalities, new forms of inequities. 
And so I, I think um, it, it, we need to take seriously and, and really take a good stock of what is going on underneath the hood, if you will, underneath the cover of the focus on technology toward meeting the needs of trying to mitigate the, the transmission of COVID-19. And how, for instance, just to point out one example, last example, and I'll end on this, how there have been interest by techno, um, techno capitalists to try to accelerate certain developments, for instance, in public schooling, and how certain governments um, that I shall, no, I won't rename names because it's, it's quite public. I mean, um, uh, I'm blanking on her name right now, um, uh, disaster capitalism. Um, uh, anyways, if someone else can remember her name, please, please um, chime in. But um, had, had actually um, made the argument that in fact, or actually uncovered how um, uh, Cuomo, the governor of New York state, was actually opening the doors for technical capitalists to come in and actually make strides of developments they had been wanting to make before, but were being put on hold because of the ethical concerns. But literally making strides to say, well, maybe we need to completely transform public schooling to something remote, something virtual, something beyond the what, what many of us will understand is the value and importance of the in-person, that that cannot be completely precluded from the pedagogical process. Okay, I'm gonna stop on that. No, it's good, I know it's so relevant. And then what I would encourage people to kind of think about, it's a metaphor that helps me, is there was a century ago, everything was electrified. It was infused with electricity. There were massive increases in productivity. And then there were decades of labor strife until eventually some of those productivity games were actually shifted to working people. And that, of course, you know, was sort of the post-World War II rise was fueled, uh, if you will, by decades of labor strife preceding that and things coming to a head in World War II. And now everything's being being uh, digitized and productivity gains are going up. And just like the roaring 20s, 20s labor is not really getting any of that. It's all going to the wealthy. We're seeing what, what's going on with the billionaires and the rest of us right now. And so we have an opportunity not to repeat history. It's repeating itself. But we have the, that requires us to have these conversations, figure out agendas, and then figure out how do you get ahead of the curve so you know you don't have to go through like 30 years of basically civil war between labor and capital to get to a place uh, where you have a better deal uh, for the country, just to put it in, in plain terms. And by the way, there was a question in the chat that I just want to give a quick nod to from uh, Ms. Wong, who asked essentially, how can uh, old school organizers um, make use of technology to you know, help win in today's times? And I would say really, you know, look into, you can go to defendtheblackvote.org. It's a program of people for the American way. Defend the Black Vote uh, empowers you to use texting to turn out voters. Um, you know, there, there are a range of other groups who are doing things like this, but you're basically looking at peer-to-peer -peer texting technology is sort of at the core of it. And it is uh, very, very easy and it's incredible. When you can go through a day and found that you've touched a thousand different voters, you've gotten responses from a hundred of them and you've responded to them and you maybe spent three hours. For somebody who's in old school organizing, it sort of blows your mind. Um, so, Ms. Wong, but turning back, is he gonna stay with you and then I wanna come back to Mutale for a second. Um, talk to us, just your view of kind of techno political systems and how they might be reimagined. And also knowing that every time there's a disaster, there are these leaps, right? And it tends to privilege the techno capitalists. What do you think, what should the conversations be now? Um, because we saw it with Hurricane Katrina, right? We see it with the pandemic, the vulture capitalists, the techno capitalists, the folks with the capital seem to have the leg up and they leap forward and the rest of us seem to get pushed back. So what should we be doing differently? What's the conversation we should be having? So uh, I'm gonna make this question thing. I think you're absolutely right. Any moment of disaster or crisis creates conditions of opportunity, possibility, potentiality, depending on how we approach it. Um, and oftentimes it's the ones who with the resources and the political decision-making power that have the over, obviously the overhand and able to, able to, to um, shape what those conditions of possibility are. However, I think that um, what the digital also enables is a lot of, on the ground work, on the ground movement. It actually enables what I would characterize as an agonistic system. Literally a system that is um, not antagonistic in the sense of a kind of dualism, but agonistic where it's a constant uh, system of, of, of maneuvering, positioning. I might even say war, if you will, on a quotidian level. And so it, 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 if we can 
get more folk um, with that are trained in technology, trained in data analysts, trained in AI, that understand the system, but also willing to have the political on, ontology, the political ideologies of a kind of progressive politics that's willing to engage in that work, which means they're not going to get the pay the the hedge fund money that they would with that same with that same skill set. Um, then I think there's a possibility that we can begin to move toward a kind of agonistic politics moving more in other directions. Now, what this also means is we need fundamentally an open system. So we need to rethink recursion. Part of my argument is that recursion is part of the issue. Recursive, recur the recursive systems that have been developed in AI, most, most of which have been based on a closed system. And a closed system that is merely taking that which is understood to be alien to it, xeno to it, different, othered to it, and seeks to compress it into its same logic. How to maintain a reconfiguring, changing same in order to maintain the logic of whiteness and white supremacy and racial capitalism. What we need is a fundamentally rethink, reimagine, and, and um, I, I wanna be careful, develop something anew that is opening up systems of recursion to being fundamentally transformed. That is to say the epistemologies and the logics of the system to be fundamentally transformed by that which is understood to be incomputable, infinite to its system. Every system is finite, so infinite to its system, othered and different. Um, I can say more, but I want to, I'll stop there. I, 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 I want to also give space for, for Mutali to, to, to chime in or even for, for, her, for other questions. So Mutali, please dive in. I can see your mind turning. I could ask you a question, but I really want to hear what you're thinking. So I just have a, a, a couple of responses just to that specifically, and then I, I can definitely take more questions, where I'm working in a reality where I'm I'm telling funders and you know high net worth people that we actually do need that hedge fund money to do to do this work. We actually do need tech salaries to do this work because the people who are leading specifically on the racial justice front are often people that have that are coming from industry. And therefore, if we can be paid this money to do bad in the face of capitalism, there has to be an economy in doing good. And that really didn't mean anything until January 6, 2020. And the reason that that became so significant January 6, 2020, was thanks to the work that AI for the People had been doing on dis racially charged dis and misinformation in the city of Philadelphia, we had a huge Proud Boys data set. We didn't look for that Proud Boys data set, but when Walter Wallace Jr. was killed by the police on October 27th, which was the week before the 2020 election, we were already monitoring uh, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube for online discourse because we wanted to under we we had a counter narrative to a disinformation hashtag and we wanted to see what happened. And suddenly, that Proud Boys data set became incredibly valued valuable to people who want to do good. That then created bargaining. And for, for people like me who are hiring, I'm in the business of creating work, I was then able to go back and say, look, Timnit Gebru has been pushed out of Google. She was doing ethical AI specifically with a, with a, a focus on race. If I want to hire that person, then you have to fund in such a way. And then there are other, um, you know, um, I'm trying to think Jeff, Jeff Bezos is, uh, Mackenzie Scott is really creating this new class of a uh, high net worth person who understands that race is a thing and also understands that black people want to save the save the republic which is why this was prior to this start and ben i really appreciate that email that i read from you from 2012 because what you were doing was advocating for a black woman stacy abrams to come to the attention of white male funders and i'm finding that even in my own work that is now becoming more compelling. So I would invite you that as we're reimagining, we also reimagine a world where people that work in labor organizing can do good and do well. People that work in racial justice can do good and do well, because if we don't invest in that economy, we are not going to have a republic. Oh, amen. And I would direct the students to, if you're curious, this kind of nexus, look at the work of Kpor Capital, my old firm, where I was for five years. We were kind of one of the few 
who are right here at the nexus of these issues. Uh, we funded about 150 startups in that time and um, set the pace for funding black women, which unfortunately doesn't, doesn't take much um, uh, in the Valley. Um, the, but you're absolutely right that there's a, you know, as one of as like the only civil rights leader who came into tech investing, um, you know, what you see is a lot of people are coming in from industry with a certain mindset. So even if, if they, if they look like us, they come, they grew up in our communities, they're not really coming in with the mindset of social change leaders and, and mindset matters, mindset mm -hmm. matters. I want to shift now and kind of in, in, in invite the audience to ask, to ask questions. We have one question here from uh, Ms. Jones who asked, you mentioned Ford and MacArthur, what roles does philanthropy and government play in funding these transformations? And I would say that's both on the nonprofit side and the for-profit side. Like we know that uh, the biggest recipients of US federal government dollars is Elon Musk. So I'll just turn that over to both of you. Um, I can, I can, I can certainly speak about philanthropy, but I would also encourage people to think about social enterprise. So in the AI for the people story, we are definitely a child of, of the big, um, big five philanthropies. And that was because, um, educate, you know, communications folks were just not, um, not represented and i think they were to add that to their portfolio but we were also using computational methods to measure impact and from a philanthropic point of view when they're asking you what's your impact what's your impact we were able to show that we were able to measure um in in a qualitative way um quantitative way i should say in terms of government it's really funny so we uh AI for the people are being pulled into a number of transition conversations um, because we have the skills, but also the outlook to help push Biden Harris towards this racial equity goal. And we're certainly advocating that there will be no racial equity in this country unless we have a real understanding of the role AI governance plays in delivering uh, systems to uh, the American people. So I would invite any of the students and faculty at this particular school to keep in touch with us because we are not, we are living in an, a delivery of services is now uh, mediated through these technologies. But we've really lent into um we've really lent into business so we are producing a docu-series right now with rada film studios if anybody knows their work they produced american promise which was a 13-year film of a black boy going to the dalton school here in new york and looking at how race place education elitism um shaped him so we're we're really looking at the way um facial recognition technology specifically, but biometrics impact black life. It's very likely, you know, it's nothing is promised, but that probably it's very likely that we'll get an acquisition out of that. And we're coming in as major investors in that particular uh, that 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 particular endeavor here in Philadelphia, in the project that we did around dis and misinformation, we discovered a micro influencer economy. So one of the things that we did to counteract uh, online disinformation is that we recruited um, hot black people in Philly that had large social media followings and um, asked them to join our band. We gave them a couple of thousand dollars and we said, please create content. Um, around the theme that we have to vote down COVID. And we did political education, health education, but they were really uh, critical at pushing us over the line because when we measured the impact of vote down COVID, which was our hashtag versus vote down ballot, which was telling black Philadelphians not to vote at the top of the ticket, but to vote below. Um, as a way to uh, discourage them from taking part in the 2020 election, we got 8.4 million impressions in a week versus um, our, uh, the disinformation a technique that got 2.4 million um, impressions in that week. And funders in Philadelphia came forward and said, what are you? And we said that we, you know, we're a data journalism firm, just like Reuters is a picture firm. You can come by um, our skills. You can, if you don't know what's going on in social media, you don't know what's going on. But beyond that, we're, um, we're giving, we're paying people to do what they would do. And while we could twerk and uh, sell lip gloss as micro influencers, we can also advance democracy. And so building up these new 
uh, economies is a major thing for us because I don't know if AI for the people will do this, but our sister, uh, our sister Professor Dixon Roman, Naomi Klein, whose whose name you were looking for, you know, we want to reimagine capitalism, and guess what? Technology is going to help us do that, we, and and we we think that we we think that we have partners. So um, hopefully, weaning ourselves off philanthropy um, ultimately. Uh, and being self-sustaining, but there, you know, nothing is more dangerous than a poor black woman because I will stretch that fifty. You know, I will make a dollar of fifteen cents, um, and and not put myself in a situation where I have to be trendy to get funding. Well, nothing is more dangerous than a poor black woman. That would, you know, brought up images of Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, uh, Professor Dixon Roman, we have a couple minutes left. I want to give you the last word of this section before I turn it before I wrap and turn it over to our colleague. I, I think Lutale said, said, said it all. The only thing I'll add is um, the dangers of philanthropy and neoliberalism, um, and um, and this not being unrelated to, in fact, the lack of government and policy intervention on controlling um, digital acts, digital technology, particularly the major digital corporations like Google, AWS, Facebook, Twitter, right? Where what happened recently, where they um, canceled accounts, canceled Trump's account and others, um, right? And in the last, I mean, this has been going on. So they canceled it in the last moment um, because of this, a major insurrection. Um, but in fact, um, it's too late. It's completely too late. Um, and in fact, if government had been acting prior to, this could have been intervened and prevented sooner, or at least mitigated sooner, right? And I would say the same thing, the same logic applies to the reliance on philanthropy versus government intervention. And, mm -hmm. and, just, to, and, and just to add to that really quickly, because I definitely want the room to come in, you know, having worked on the Deep Fakes Accountability Act and really led that and, and written that statute, we were told that this would never be able to happen. There were First Amendment issues. And I, my argument then, as it is now, is that the First Amendment is protecting government, first of all, so we can speak out against our government. It's not, pri it's not private corporations, but it's built on this idea that we have goodwill that we love each other, that we are in a compassionate society where we are only going to use our speech in the service of the American project. Um, and so when those cancellations came down, it was so bittersweet. Um, because where were you when black feminists were being harassed online? And we have existing laws that we can enact, different Zoom, I will get off my soapbox, but we don't actually have to create new laws. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm gonna uh, make a hard pivot here because we've got a wrap, we're coming up. I wanna thank both of you and thank the Dean and uh, thank Professor uh, Kristen. Um, uh, the one name I didn't ask how to, how to pronounce, uh, De Power. De Power. Um, I uh, really want to encourage the students to think about this in very practical terms. You know, if you're wondering what it looks like when let's say a community mental health worker uh, decides to bring their idea, not to the government or to a foundation, but to Silicon Valley to fund, uh, go look at um, healthify.com, um, healthify which is founded by Johns Hopkins community health workers who've scaled up and help people figure out when you're working in an ER room where 10% of the population is using 50% of the services, how do you get people all the social supports and then track whether they're going there in a way that goes far beyond what those three community uh, health workers could have done uh, on their own just in the old mode. That's how you add tech to human. Um, if you're really, you know, um, you know, want to really explore sort of your own agency and your own power, I'll be teaching a course at the law school that's open to SB2 students called Leading Social Change. Uh, and we go into, and part of it is about launching social impact startups. Um, and also uh, we'll likely be teaching a course just on that at SB2 in the future as I did uh, last spring. I wanna thank everybody here for, for really trying to help us sort of get ahead of the curve. So much of this is kind of at the 
you know, us staying behind the curve and talking about neoliberalism, just to put that in kind of like brass tacks, um, I'm a numbers person. Uh, in philanthropy, the, where neoliberalism really creates a problem, if you will, is that it takes 100% of the money and invests it in the status quo and blue chip stocks and big companies and 5% and invest that in social change. That's, that's the budget, you know, the 11 billion of the Ford Foundation, 5% of that is invested. It's a lot of grant money, but it's a lot more money going in to the status quo. And so that's ultimately what we're trying to get ahead of. And so if you're asking yourself, why would I uh, seek to reimagine capitalism? Why would I use those tools? Well, they're powerful tools and there's a lot more money over there. And so if you can bring a vision, if you can actually not you know, reimagine it, you might just find yourself cooking with gas uh, in a very, very powerful way. And that's what the folks at Healthify are experiencing. Now I wanna just uh, turn it over to uh, Jerry uh, Bo uh, Bourgeollet uh, to kind of lead us through uh, the wrapping of this engaging conversation. Jerry. Thank you. I want to I want to thank Ben, Ezekiel, and Mitali for this very engaging and also informative discussion today. As SB2's Associate Dean for Inclusion, this program is the perfect example of the kind of dialogue we want to create in our SB2 community. As a school, SB2 is committed to the principles of anti-racism, anti-oppression, intersectionality, inclusion, diversity, and social justice in our educational programs and our interactions with our colleagues, students, and our external partners, as well as the school's culture. I invite you to learn more about our work by visiting our SB2 inclusion page. The link will be in the chat. You can also um, find out more information about upcoming programs and there'll be details soon about our next event, which will be in February. I invite all of you to join us and stay tuned for more exciting discussions at SB2. Thank you, everyone. Um, what a great, I, I'm just so inspired and um, need, needed this today uh, in this time. And so um, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Ben, Mitali, Ezekiel, Jerry. Most importantly, also Kristen and your team, David, for uh, keeping us um, active in technology as we uh, in a perfectly implemented Zoom call. So thank you, everyone. It's uh, inspirational to be able to um, be a part of this, and I'm and I'm humbled by your contributions to our school. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, Dolly, let me let me check. can I say something? Okay, I think that this conversation reminds me and underscores and emphasizes so much more why we need a uh, uh, focus on technology and digital governance in the school. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. I, you know, uh, Ben Ben's work and his comments today, Mutali's comments today, uh, the conversation today just really emphasizes and underscores this. Um, yeah, it's I, great, really yeah. great. Well, so thank you, everyone. I, I, um, I really appreciate it. I'm sorry, Mitali, I interrupted you. No, I was saying it's funny that you're saying that because uh, the, our transition work is looking at uh, racial equity and AI governance. And just some of the conversations where I'm saying those chat boxes that you have for answering American people's questions, a billion dollars worth of investment, r and investment went into that. And, you know, NSF isn't even, <laughs> like you're outspending and outstripping NSF, but you're not realizing that in something that even in, as innocuous as that, depending mm -hmm. on the code track, those questions are not always being raised and answered, yet those are the tracks that have the highest inequality. And so in, and until we, and until we can think about how racism creep in, even if for I, I, you know, I, I live in a poor neighborhood coming from my zip code, will my question be answered? Yeah. Of course it won't because the algorithm is optimized to scale and to the most quote unquote efficient and the most efficient 
isn't Bed-Stuy Brooklyn, it right. may be the East Side. And so any work that the school are, are okay. doing, we would be really um, interested. And Professor Jealous, I wish I'd had that class. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, I unfortunately have to hop off. I am all about continuing this conversation, whether it's now or, uh, and I should say now and later, Ezekiel. So um, thank you all. I'm sorry I have to, to go because I don't really want to, but. Um, <laughs> thank you, Sarah. And by so, the way, everybody, I have a stutter, so you. I do word replacement. So if I like use a title for somebody and a first name for somebody else, just know that's what's happening.